All right, I'm going to talk about the, the networking TS. Uh, Harald uh, convinced me to add high performance to the top, and it's kind of <laughs> accurate. Um, I'll try to have some actual concrete like code that works, sort of, but somewhat simplified. Uh, so it's, I'm hoping to keep it pretty practical and concrete. Uh, just briefly about myself, why am I talking about the networking TS? Uh, I've used uh, Boost ASIO uh, for about 10 years, uh, which the networking TS is based on. Uh, I am the author of a BitTorrent library that's open source, uh, which also uses a lot of networking. Uh, I'm a former chief of architect, uh, chief architect at uh, BitTorrent, and now I work at Blockstream, and we do uh, blockchain stuff. Enough about me. Uh, so the networking TS, it's a technical specification, so it's not the standard, and it's still a moving target. Uh, things change, you know, every few months. Uh, detailed mostly. Uh, it's a cross-platform uh, networking abstraction for C++, so it uses modern C++. What does modern mean? It means using uh, modern, like new uh, best practices in C++. So it doesn't have a C style interface, doesn't have a Java style interface, but uh, it actually takes advantage uh, advantages of uh, uh, C++. So there are two implementations. Uh, Chris, uh, the man behind uh, Boost ASIO, has one. Uh, and then Jonathan Wakeley has one uh, in Libsted C++, so it's in experimental. Um, also, I just want to um, thank uh, Vina Falco. He's been helping me a little bit with um, some of the preparations for this talk. Uh, he gave a good talk uh, at CppCon 2018 uh, that I would recommend if you want sort of a broader introduction to the fundamental concepts. Uh, and he's also the author of Boost Beast, which is an HTTP and WebSocket library. Uh, it builds on top of uh, Boost ASIO and uh, Networking TS. Uh, it's a great source of just good utilities for networking in general, uh, even if you're not using WebSocket or HTTP. So this is, these are the topics I'm hoping to cover today. Uh, just briefly about Proactor Reactor and sort of like how asynchronous uh, programs are sort of built, uh, and the basic asynchronous operations in the networking TS. <coughs> and yeah, I don't need to read this off. I'm going to uh, have small, small like breaks when you can see when I'm switching topic. Um, and it's going to be basically generally useful things for beginners, and then sort of off into the weeds uh, the, the closer we get to the end. Um, and, and sort of towards the end, that's also where the high performance aspect of this talk comes in. So let's briefly talk about proactors. Uh, a proactor is basically the model where you say, I want to perform this operation, tell me when it's done. And then somehow you're told when it's done. Uh, this was the original Boost ASIO model, and I think probably the, the most common way of using bo both Boost ASIO and the networking TS still. Uh, it looks sort of like this. You have a socket, you say async write, here's a buffer, and then here's a function object. Call it when this write operation completes. Uh, the other way of doing things is a reactor, where you say, let me know when it's okay to write to this socket. When you're told that it's okay, then you per perform a synchronous write operation to that socket. And you know that it's not gonna block because you've been told that it's, it's uh, okay to write to it. Uh, so in, this is also supported by the, net, the networking TS. It looks something like this. You say uh, async wait for socket to be like wait write, wait for the socket to be writable. And then you pass in a function object uh, that gets called when the socket is, readable, uh, is writable. And then you perform your uh, synchronous write operation. Uh, so the networking TS also supports synchronous operations, by the way, but that's not what this talk covers. I'm mostly going to talk about asynchronous because sort of that's, that's where you end up in sort of larger, more complicated and um, higher performance uh, applications. So the, the basic operations uh, and the sort of basic building blocks of the networking TS uh, is, is that the operations, well, I just said that some of them are synchronous, but the, the operations that I'm going to talk about are asynchronous, uh, which means that you're kicking off some, some work and you're being told 
when it's done. So you need some mechanism, some channel to be told about when it's being done. Uh, and this notification mechanism uh, uh, has, uh, is sort of run by this class called IO context. The IO context is sort of like a job queue. You can uh, post jobs to it and it will like uh, take one job at a time and, and execute uh, the jobs or handlers, completion handlers really. Um, and uh, a completion handler is a function object. So a function object, in case someone isn't familiar, is just an instance of a class that, or, uh, that implements the call operator. Uh, so you can uh, put that into the job queue and it will be called. Right? So, the, the, so the, the, the fundamental operations on the NIA context is you can run it, and that's basically uh, waiting for new work, new handlers to be run, and then running them, and then wait for uh, more uh, handlers to be run. Uh, you can pull, which is sort of like run, but you just run uh, whatever is queued up right now. You don't wait, so it's not blocking. And then you have a post, which is sort of the other end, where you say, um, I want to put this at the end of the queue uh, to be run. Uh, and defer is interesting. It's sort of like, I want to put this at the front of the queue. So I want to run it, but I want to sort of skip the line, which sometimes is useful. Um, and Yes, question. Do you know why defer? This sounds backwards to me. Um, so normal. So why why is it called defer? Yeah, the name. I don't have. A, I might, might not have a good answer. My uh, my model, mental model of it is uh, normally when you you want to use defer, if you are already inside a handler uh, and you want to uh, call someone else's handler, uh, and you can't really call it directly because then you risk like getting really deep stack and like potentially infinite recursion so you want to say run this immediately after i'm done so that you can then exit your handler and then the next person's handler gets run right. that makes sense. Uh, so the i say essentially three uh, primitives um, t you have tcp socket you have udp socket and you have a steady timer there are other timers too based on other clocks uh, from uh, chrono but steady timer i would say is the most useful one it's the monotonic time. Um, so let's look at a simple example uh, with the timer. This is a simple example. Let's, let's uh, walk through what we do here. Uh, we create the IO context. We always need the IO context to, to be able to receive our not, uh, completion notifications. We create a timer with the IO context. We pass that in so it knows where to post uh, completions. And then we create a lambda, or we rather we create a function object called onTimer, and this is a lambda expression that introduces a function object. Uh, this function object takes an error code, uh, and if it's if something went wrong, we get an error and we print out the error. Otherwise, we just print down. So it's an example. Then we arm the timer to say it will expire in five seconds, and then we say async wait. So we wait on the timer. So far, uh, nothing really interesting have happened, but then we call I run on, on the IO context and run will block and uh, it will keep blocking until there's no work to be done. And as long as there's an outstanding timer, that counts as work and it will block until the, the timer fires. When does it start? Uh, it expires or it wait? It, I, I believe it's, it starts when you say expires after. Uh, I think there's also an expires at where you can specify a, an absolute uh, time. Um, uh, right, so that's what it looks like. So basically there's this sort of if you think about how the control flow works, uh, that on timer right, refers back to that lambda, uh, to that function object. So uh, it gets run. Um, so it, I guess you sort of write the code back in the, in the opposite order of, of, uh, of what it actually happens. Uh, so let's look at a slightly more, is any, any questions so far? By the way, feel free to interrupt me if, I'm, if there's anything that's unclear. Uh, so a slightly more complex example. Uh, here I have a socket. Uh, and what this program does is it connects 
the socket and it writes some bytes and then it's done. It, it sends some uh, a message. Um, so this is more interesting because you may see that we only kick off a single, we only initiate a single asynchronous operation in the main program and then in its completion handler we initiate the second asynchronous operation. So we sort of have this connection back there and then we have another connection back to the on-write uh, function object or handler. Uh, and then as I mentioned when on-write exits uh, that's when the IO context runs out of work to do. That's the last handler, uh, uh, the last asynchronous operation that completes. Uh, so you sort of also have this other, uh, in this program, uh, flow back to exit uh, the, the run function on the IO context. Crystal clear so far. Oh, question. Uh, right, so uh, exactly. So the, uh, this is Slideware, so I, I took some, sh some shortcuts. SOC is not declared anywhere here, right? It's assumed to be declared further up. Uh, but it's, it's a, it cap the, the, the Lambda captures everything by reference, so it, it makes it good. It, and and um, completion handlers, almost all of them either just take an error code or they take an error code and the number of bytes. Uh, okay, there, there is another. If you do like a hostname lookup, you get here's a bunch of uh, endpoints. Another question. Yeah, when the IOC run ends, does it disconnect the socket or is it still uh, like running? Or um, or open well, the socket will destruct when it goes out of scope and uh, that will close it. So, yeah. Uh, one question is uh, because I have the application, I have this IO context, and I was right running the context. I'm just posting Java to the IO context, but uh, at that moment uh, when I'm posting, maybe they, they run after the Java, <coughs> then the IO dot run will finish. But I might have a uh, job later when I want to post the queue. It won't be run. So, is there any good way to solve this? Uh, yes. So the the, question, the comment slash question was, what if you run out of job, but then just later, just a know. moment after or much later yeah. perhaps you want to post another job and then run is no longer running yeah. uh, so there's a, a work guard i believe it's called uh, it's actually changed name uh, uh, since boostasio so there's a work guard where you can basically say uh, this thing counts as an outstanding operation so don't don't terminate uh, the run loop yeah. uh, and when that thing destructs then you sort of uh, uh, you that that asynchronous operation in goes counts as being removed, uh, you know completed. So mm -hmm. then it's uh, so so if you want to keep the IO context alive, you need to basically have a work guard. It's like a steady timer or usable timer, always like ten seconds, run one time to keep it uh, Well, I, it kind of depends on your program where you want to keep it alive. Right? At some point, you want to be able to kill it when it's time to shut down, for instance. So, but if you if there's, you know, you might want one from the start of a program to the end of a program, and when you, you know, want to shut down, you, you delete your uh, worker. Uh, is there any guarantees of uh, not starting an internal thread? Uh, no, uh, I believe I'm pretty sure. Yes. So basically, the the way it works is all of your, uh, all of your handlers. Are guaranteed to be run from a thread that is currently running run on the IO context. Um, you you know if you if you want to be sophisticated, you can run run from a multiple threads. So you have a thread pool, for instance. I'm not going to talk about multi-threading, but uh, I probably should have since I said it was high performance and you, know, you want to do that. Then, but it gets it gets complicated. Maybe next talk. All right. But in basis, the basic thing is you can sort of rely on those handlers are in the same thread because uh, run is in the same thread. Which exactly, is nice. right. Mm. Um, okay, so let's talk about object lifetime. So you notice that in, in the previous examples, the socket uh, was um, declared first, then run returned, there was nothing left, and then the socket was instructed. So the socket has to stay alive for the entire duration. 
of uh, asynchronous operations, as that first bullet says. Uh, the, there are a few ways to ensure that this, uh, that this is the case, and there are a few um, ways to, that are very difficult to, to you know, basically you want, you want to make sure that your program always guarantees that you never have any outstanding operation on any I.O. object uh, that is being destruct destructed. And uh, that's not always trivial to, to ensure unless you're following certain sort of guidelines or rules. And uh, I would suggest that there are primarily two ways of doing this sanely. One is to always hold the underlying I.O. object with a shared pointer or some smart pointer and always have all of your handlers also uh, hold it by, by a smart pointer so that any outstanding operation always implies that the underlying I.O. object is kept alive. Uh, the other way of doing it is to basically pass on the responsibility to someone else where you say, uh, I'm building a composed asynchronous operation that under the hood will do a bunch of other operations uh, but I take your handler and I will call it when I'm done with everything. So you can't delete the underlying object until I call your handler. So basically you provide the same rules and the same guarantees as the normal uh, async write and async wait does. Yes? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Would it be enough to just have all the objects owned by the same context where you're calling run? Uh, right, so as the, the first bullet is, you can also just make sure that everything is in, in scope, in the yes. same scope where you, uh, where you call run. Uh, that mostly works for like simple toy examples and slideware, basically, but as, uh, as soon as your application becomes a bit bigger, uh, you might want to have multiple sockets simultaneously and might maybe a variable number of sockets and so on. But I will, I'll go into details about the object lifetime uh, and what I mean by these things in more concrete terms. Um, so one really important guarantee that the networking TS makes is that whenever you initiate an asynchronous operation, your handler will be called exactly once. Not zero times, not twice, but exactly once. Uh, and and this, is even, this is true also if you cancel the timer or close the socket. If you have an outstanding read or write to a socket and you close the socket, all of your outstanding handlers will be called uh, with the operation aborted error. Uh, so this is important uh, uh, because maybe you are doing reference counting. Maybe you're doing reference counting not via a smart pointer, but in your handler you decrement some, some counter. Uh, uh, but there are also other situations where it's really, um, it's really sane and guaranteed to always have this. Uh, and I kind of uh, compare this to destructors, that a destructor is called exactly once and not zero times and not twice, right? It's exactly once. So when you initiate, whenever you initiate uh, an asynchronous operation, it always also is completed in some way, whether it's canceled or uh, completes with an error or, or is aborted. Um, so so this, this guarantee is really important to preserve when you implement your own higher level uh, operations as well. <clears throat> so, um, for example, as I mentioned, if you call cancel, uh, your handler gets called, is uh, posted, right, or uh, called with the operation aborted error, but you're not guaranteed that they're called with the operation aborted. Maybe the read operation or the write operation actually completed behind your back and you haven't seen it yet because you're running some other handler and you're canceling the socket. You cannot, you cannot uh, assume that just because you called cancel, any handler that's called after you called cancel will have this error. It may be called you know, with a complete, uh, some complete operation. So for example, this is not okay. Uh, and this is just you know, difficult code to understand without me explaining what I'm trying to convey. Uh, but imagine that you have a connection object. It contains a socket and uh, it has an on-read handler that's called whenever some read operation on the socket completes. Uh, the first thing you do is check uh, 
uh, oh, was, was the read operation aborted? In that case, just back out and pretend I didn't touch anything in, in my object because it might have been destroyed. And then in the destructor, the first thing you do is cancel and then destroy the socket. And thinking that I'm done because the completion handler will be called with operation aborted. So it's not going to, it's not going to, uh, you know, do anything bad. Uh, ignoring the fact that obviously calling on read on a destroyed object is undefined behavior. You're also not guaranteed that it will actually um, be called with, with the operation aborted. So as I mentioned, basically, by the time you call cancel, the completion for on read might already have been queued up in your, in your job queue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's, that's bad. Would, uh, uh, is there any standard parser that would have been able to detect this? Or well or so the main, I think, I'm not sure, are there any sanitizers that will tell you if you call a member function on a destroyed object? I don't no, know. you can't. <laughs> I, I, I don't know of a, of a sanitizer that will tell you that. Uh, uh, you know, once every now and then, you might actually, uh, this might actually happen. But it might not be very frequent, so right, chances are that it will always you will always get operation aborted in your tests and you know locally. But you ship it to customer and then they don't. This uh, we have tried actually. We, this shit exactly hit us many times, and uh, we even ran Volgrand and uh, address the sanitizer. You can't catch it because it can be some web socket on the real production. It's uh, some timing issue, so Volgrand cannot catch it all the time. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a logic about. It. Yeah. So, so the, the reason I bring this up is these these are the kinds of things that I tried to do for years, and I like tried to hack more and more complex stuff to to get it to work, and eventually realized that fundamentally this is broken. You cannot do this. Uh, so, to, to to show this sort of on a timeline, imagine you you have the socket there and you issue an asynchronous operations, and if you yank it under the feet of the the last async read there. Yeah, it, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to ensure that the socket lifetime um, extends p past the complete, the last completion the, of, of the last async operation. <coughs> so here's another example uh, of something that might be really tempting to do. I was really tempted. I, this is one of the things I did for years uh, that didn't work. Uh, I tried to get it to work. Uh, so this kind of looks like innocent code, right? This is my UDP socket. I constructed passing a, a function object, and I'm like, how about you just call this function every time there's a there's a new packet that comes in? And then you have a destruct destructor, and you destroy the socket. And what exactly happens in the destructor? And what happens to the the, the function object? Uh, so so this this is violating this rule of the handler is called exactly once, right? This this might potentially be called multiple times. Um, so there are a few issues here. Um, in the destructor, the socket, the underlying socket will be closed, right? So there might be some, whatever wrapped handler this UDP socket has, it cannot be a member function of the UDP socket. It has to be of some other heap allocated uh, object, right? Because it's undefined behavior to, to get a member function called on you after you're destroyed. Um, and then the buffer itself also would have to live somewhere else. Uh, so it's possible that you can implement this interface, but how helpful is going to be to the user because the user will then put this in a class somewhere and what what's this function object going to be it's probably going to be you know bind stood bind to its own member function so when it destroys its its own class it might still get callbacks from this after it's destroyed right that's that's a like mind boggling thing it, it doesn't make any sense like it, it would be impossible to write correct, well, not impossible, but very difficult, very likely to write incorrect code uh, with an, uh, an interface like this. So these are the two solutions that I mentioned. Um, I, I ignore the sort of example code version where you just tie everything to a single scope, but hold it by a shared pointer or delegate the responsibility uh, by wrapping it up in uh, a compo like a composed operation where you also take a handler and you do all your asynchronous operation and then you call the handler and it's the user of your compose operation that's responsible for so the, the lifetime. Well, there you, you mean like all the lambdas that you have as completion handlers, if they capture the shared pointer, the, it guarantees that the shared pointer is alive as long as that completion handler is registered to be called at some point. Right, exactly. So this, this is how I would illustrate this. Uh, I don't know, 
but uh, about this illustration, I mean, green lines that's supposed to indicate a uh, plus one reference or something. So you, this is the connection object. It's held by a shared pointer, right? Let's say it's in some container or some kind. Every time it issues an asynchronous operation, say async connect, async write, async read, uh, it passes on another shared pointer to itself to force keeping it alive. And if whoever is using this connection object is like, I'm done with this, let's just say close on it and remove it from my container, uh, it will still be alive. Uh, and hopefully it will know that it's supposed to shut down, right, and not do anything, uh, anything else. But things will still be sane, at least. Um, this is something that makes sense sort of at the top level, I guess you would say. At the, it doesn't compose very well. If you, if you have a connection object and then you have another connection object that, oh, I should use this first connection object, you're gonna have a stack of just things holding each other by a shared pointer and you basically get like Java or something. Uh, so it's not the most efficient way to stack composed operations uh, or to compose things in general. So, so this is the other mechanism, or this is how I would illustrate the other mechanism, where uh, I have my async request. It looks like any other asynchronous operation. It takes a handle or a, a completion handler and in, it holds onto it. And internally, it issues asynchronous operations. And when it's done, it calls the completion handler that was passed in. So, uh, and then basically just says, whoever is using me, it's your responsibility to make sure that the underlying operation, uh, uh, the underlying object stays alive. So you can imagine that you can stack these efficiently and at the bottom you can have a shared pointer, like in a connection object for instance. So I want to dive into a little bit deeper into this connection object. Uh, and we're going to look at look at some code, uh, pretty simple. Uh, <coughs> imagine you have long-lived connections, and you have repeated reads, repeated writes, uh, and you have a bunch of state per connection. Uh, so you can imagine something like this. I don't know if how, this, how intuitive this is, but imagine the connection object is an instance of this class. Uh, it has an on-read member function and an on-write member function. They issue asynchronous read operations, and they get called, they call, you know, themselves get called uh, when th there is some incoming data and when some data has been written. So you sort of get these two uh, loops of uh, asynchronous calls and uh, completion handlers. Uh, so it could look something like this. You have a struct, you have a connection, uh, you have on read and on write. Um, so, and as I mentioned, to make sure that it stays alive for all the outstanding uh, asynchronous operations, we need to make it held by shared pointer. So we make it, we derive it from enable shared from this. Uh, and we have the send buffer and the receive buffer. This is basically, um, the send buffer is what we'll send, keep sending out and the receive buffer is where we will receive incoming data. And then we'll, uh, we contain the socket, obviously, as a member. Uh, just as a sort of side note, shared from this, if, if you're not familiar with enable shared from this, by the way, uh, it's a clever way to make it so that you can get the shared pointer to yourself and, you know, under the expectation that whoever constructed you, uh, constructed you as a shared, uh, held by a shared pointer. Uh, but you can't do this in the constructor because the holding shared pointer haven't been constructed yet in your constructor. So normally what you have to do is you construct the connection object and then you have like a start or something where you kick off all of your asynchronous operations. But I'm not going to cover start. We're just going to look at on read and on write <coughs> and what they might look like. Um, so on read could look something like this. So this actually, this actually works. This is all you need. Um, but you know, it, the process received is, common, is just a comment, I guess. That's where all the interesting stuff would happen normally. So what are we doing here? Um, we get the error, if there's an error, uh, and we get the number of bytes that, uh, that were received in this uh, read, asynchronous read. If there's an error, just close the socket and bail out. Uh, 
And as I mentioned, when you close the socket, all other outstanding operations will also be cancelled. So this should be sufficient to sort of close down the socket. You might, in reality, you might want to do more things to, to mark the connection of it as, as closed. Um, this is just creating a string view. So we look at the receive buffer and, and tx number of bytes that we received. So these are the bytes that we received in this call, and then we process them, you know, whatever our application is doing. Uh, and then we kick off another asynchronous read. Um, so what's interesting here, we're using shared from this so that we keep ourselves alive uh, for the duration of this asynchronous read. Uh, and also we pass in ourself, right? This is, we stood bind a call to ourself uh, bound to, to our uh, shared pointer. Um, on right, looks basically the same. We also receive um, the error code and the number of bytes written. If anything went wrong, just close it and, and return. Um, uh, so this is basically removing the first tx bytes from the string. This is just to like tx number of bytes were sent. Pop them off the front of the send queue. And if there are more bytes to be sent, kick off another asynchronous write. Uh, and just like in on read, we use shared from this to keep us to keep the object alive for the duration of uh, the write, and we pass in ourselves as as the handler. All right. So maybe you noticed, but I used the function called net, net colon colon buffers buffer. So let's talk briefly about buffers. Uh, in the network TS, you have const buffer and mutable buffer, and they are basically like span and view. So they're a pointer and size pair. Uh, and const obviously is immutable, and, and mutable is mutable, as you might be able to tell. Uh, and just like span and, and, and view, they don't own the underlying storage. So these are the types that you communicate with the uh, network TS when you want to receive bytes or send bytes. Um, but you don't necessarily just want to send a single buffer. Uh, so Networking TS cleverly supports what's on Windows called scattergather or uh, write V and read V on, on POSIX, where you can say, I have all these different buffers. I want to write them in a single call. Uh, so you can you actually uh, what you actually send as a buffer is a buffer sequence. Uh, so you have a const buffer sequence. Th these are concepts, by the way. Uh, const buffer sequence and a mutable buffer sequence. And they look basically like a container of const buffer or a container of mutable buffer. Um, and, and this is uh, the buffer sequence begin, returns an iterator to the, the start of this sequence of buffers, buffer sequence ends, returns the end iterator of this buffer. So uh, this is how you enumerate buffers. This is sort of the abstraction layer on top of what otherwise would look like normal containers. Uh, but cleverly, const buffer and mutable buffer are also sequences of one. So you don't actually have to care about the fact that you're passing in sequences. You can just send in uh, a single buffer and it will be a sequence of one. There's also uh, this factory function that I had on my previous slides called buffer. It takes a long range, uh, wide range of types that can sort of be seen as buffers holding stuff. Uh, so as long as they hold, um, I think it's standard layout or maybe trivial types, uh, you can just pass them into the buffer, uh, the buffer function, and it will return uh, a const buffer or a mutable buffer, depending on whether it's uh, 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 constant or not. And so these are some examples of things you can pass into buffer. So if you just have a void, void star and, and a size, for instance, you can also pass that in. So this is how you would use it. Say you have a string, you want to, uh, to, to write it to a socket, call net buffer, pass in the string, and you get a buffer. Uh, this is actually an example of a synchronous call. I guess a lied in the beginning. Uh, but if you have a sequence of buffers, you can also send on, uh, pass in uh, a buffer sequence. So in this example, I use std array of two const buffers. And you can just pass that in as well, and it will send the same thing. Right. Hello, space world, 
new line. Oh, there's no new line there. Um, all right. So that kind of covers the connection object bullet point. So let's talk about the composing uh, object bullet point. This is a little bit more exotic. I think it's probably uh, a little bit rarer to, to do this. At least uh, I haven't been, I've been underutilizing this technique. So, but this is going back to this timeline. Uh, so we're trying to, how do you write this my async request? So we want to define uh, a high level asynchronous operation or higher level in terms of multiple, potentially multiple lower level uh, asynchronous calls. Uh, so the way this is done normally is that you have a single function object that gets called multiple times and it re-triggers some new, uh, potentially some other uh, asynchronous operation and passes in itself as the, um, as the handler. Uh, so a few examples of things just to get an idea of what a composed operation might be. Uh, for instance, uh, you can imagine a function called async read until that reads from a socket until some condition is true, say, until you receive a new line, like if you're implementing telnet or something, I don't know. Uh, or async write, instead of async, uh, instead of async write sum, you can say async write and say, I want to send this entire buffer. Don't just tell me when some of it has been sent, just tell me when all of it is sent. Or async connect and you pass in like a container of, of endpoints to try to connect. If the first one fails, try, some, try the next one and so on. And let me know when you find one that works. Uh, or I want to uh, do a SOX5 handshake and connect with this SOX5 server and then tell me when you're done and I can just use it as, uh, as any other socket and it's proxied. So these, these actually are part of the networking DS. These are pretty uh, simple, simple composed operations. But we're going to look at an example of the uh, async write, a simplified example of it that fits on a slide. So you start off with the function object that holds all your state for this, uh, for this composed operation. You take the stream and the handler, the underlying handler, as template arguments. So the stream would be the socket, for instance, but you know, it might be a UDP socket, might be a TCP socket, an SSL socket, a web socket, who knows. Um, and you have your call operator that's going to be called whenever an asynchronous operation completes. Uh, we keep the stream uh, and, uh, and the buffer that we want to send, and we keep track of how many bytes we have sent, and then the underlying handler. Uh, so holding down the underlying handler here means that uh, if, if whoever is using this asynchronous operation or this composed operation has, say, a shared pointer that holds onto the, some connection object somewhere, you know, this is where we're going to hold it, Poss potentially stacked. You know, you can, this, this it might itself be a composed operation. Uh, and then we need the, what's called the initiating function, the function that kicks off the, this asynchronous operation. So uh, this, is, this is what users would see and use. Uh, async write, the stream, the const buffer, and the handler. And this is a little bit mind, mind bending. Uh, see what I'm doing here? I'm constructing a write op with the correct template parameters. I pass in the stream, the buffer, and the handler. And uh, then I immediately invoke this function object on where it's constructed on the stack. So I pass in no error and we wrote zero bytes. Basically, that's what I'm saying here. So let's look at what our call operator doing, is doing here. So th there's a constructor and there's a call operator that I didn't actually put in any, any function bodies for. So let's look at the call operator. Whenever it's called, we either, you know, there was some error and potentially some bytes may have been written. So we increment our, our counter. This buffer plus equals is actually a neat interface of the const buffer and mutable buffers. You can say plus equals something to uh, sort of pop off the beginning of the buffer, kind of convenient. Uh, if the buffer is empty or there was an error, we're done. So in either of those cases, we're done and we just call the handler with, with the error and the number of bytes we wrote. And there's nothing else we need to do, we can just, you know, be done. If we're not done yet, 
we, we issue an asynchronous write sum. So as, async write sum is the most primitive write operation that writes some of your buffer, but not necessarily all of it. And it will tell you when it wrote some of it and how much it wrote, right? So what's buffer? Is that a number? Uh, Uh-oh, typo. It's supposed to have underscore instead of s. Yeah, it's not. It's not easy. Uh, so, and this is maybe also a bit mind-bending. What are we doing here? We're moving in ourself as the handler for this asynchronous operation. So after after this, uh, yes, it is legal because. Uh, you are just in a moved from state, and it's up to you to define what moved from means. And in this case, we're not doing anything that, we're not touching anything whose moved from state we don't control. So it's, it's good, yes. So shouldn't you put a double ampersand on the member function, or the call operator? Uh, no. Uh, you could do that, but that would restrict you more than you would necessarily need to, because you're already guaranteed by, uh, by the, the asynchronous operation that you will call, be called exactly once. Uh, and I'm not sure whether you're guaranteed that you will be called as an R value reference. And if you're not, then that would break. Well, you need to be called uh, as an R value reference to be able to do that move, right? Uh, no, you can be called as an L value, and you just end up, your, your object just ends up being in a move from state after, after this call. So it's all good, and you know the, the underlying operation isn't going to do anything else with your handler after it calls it. So this this is all fine, I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but but one interesting one interesting uh, observation here is that if you imagine some more complicated composed operation, uh, you can kind of tell that this is a state machine. It's something that gets called multiple times, and you might be in different states. You might want to like switch and do something depending on what state you're in. Uh, so. I would expect that once we have coroutines, which we sort of have, uh, I would be interested in exploring how this could be simplified and basically be turned into a coroutine. Um, so this is how we would use it. Uh, I context, you have some string, create a socket, you connect the socket, and then async write socket buffer, and then the handler, I just put the, um, the lambda in, in, in line here. Uh, so it's doing this behind the scenes, and then it calls our handler, and we're done. That's how composing, that's how you do composing. Uh, now, going back to sort of uh, error handling in normally, uh, I'm going to primarily talk about error handling when you're in the connection style um, uh, object, but uh, basically, what you have to live with is if an exception escapes from a handler into the IO context invocation of run, it will propagate that exception out of it and think, you know, you will basically, whatever you're doing around your uh, IO context run, that's where you, you will get the exception. Uh, so, if we look at this simple timer example that I had in the beginning, uh, let's say, for instance, that ec.message throws an exception. So in, in onTimer, onTimer is called by ioc.run. So we're already inside the networking TS somehow. It throws an exception. It's going to exit, and the exception is going to come out of the IOC run uh, call right there. You made that sound like it was bad. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to add any judgment at all. I think it makes perfect sense. It's very reasonable. Yes. Will it throw in all the handlers that are queued after after the exception is thrown? Uh, after that, or in the queue? Uh, yeah. Uh, the yeah. I've I've sort of been hand waving uh, past this, but right. Uh, if you you have to reset and call run again on the IO context to to keep processing any other, any handlers that might be outstanding still, uh, and I think uh, it's really poor practice to not to do that because you kind of break this, you violate this guarantee that handlers will be called exactly once if you don't. Uh, so yeah, you should go, if you handle errors at the top levels, uh, the top level, you, you should rerun, run, call run again, um, until it dies naturally, I guess. Uh, 
Could you run it in a catch block? Or? Uh, you could do that. Yeah, uh, that might be good. if you're if you're worried about something throwing exception uh, coming out of it. That's probably a good idea to uh, catch anything, maybe log it, whatever you might want to do, and then go back, uh, go back and, and call it again. You have to reset it in between to say tell you know that. Does run return something that tells if it has anything to do? Uh, run returns the number of jobs that were executed. So you could I think. loop until it says zero and just catch everything. Oh, it it just tells you how many was. Uh, Right. Well, if it right, if it but returns if zero, if it's still yes. From the first one, does it say zero or one? Uh, well, oh, if there's an exception, you know, there's no. Go back and yeah. Anyway, yeah. So. Just looping on zero might be a trap. If you don't post any, you're just gonna loop forever. Right. Uh, uh, well, zero, you exit. Yeah. You exit until it right. returns zero. Yeah. The uh, production code could use exception. Yes. Okay. We disable exception. Okay. Yeah, well, that makes error handling tricky. Um, so basically, if you are building a composed operation, the thing we just saw, right, the async write, uh, I think the right thing to do is to basically don't touch exceptions, just let them propagate uh, th through. Uh, and if you, um, but if you're at the top level, sort of in, in the connection object, you, that's probably the right context to handle the errors and not at the sort of IO context, the whole program context. Uh, if some handler in this one connection throws an exception, um, I would suggest that it probably makes sense to close that connection and maybe do something else, but whatever is done, it should be local to that connection, most likely. Uh, so what can we do? We can wrap all of our handlers in a try block like this. So try, catch, and then disconnect the, so the connection. Let's assume we have a disconnect function. But what if the exception isn't an error code? Am I? No. I, no. Oh, no. This is a function body try, catch. So it's just the function body is a try, catch block. OK, I've never seen that. <laughs> it's, it's really neat. Um, yeah, it works for for loops too, and really? while loops, I think. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, however, though, if <laughs> uh, if the you know if the error isn't a system error, it might be some other, say, bad alloc or something. You probably want to catch std exception also, and disconnect. But then you don't really know. Maybe you want to log or something. Uh, and then maybe for good measures, because you really don't want to leak anything out of IOC run, uh, you might want to catch dot 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 and just disconnect and like throw up your hands. What's going on? We don't know. Um, problem is, uh, you end up getting this code duplicated a lot of times, uh, especially if these catch handlers do anything more sophisticated than just call disconnect. But, but just the uh, disconnect is not the end of the story. Socket can still connect to you back, call you back actually. And you have to guarantee. Yeah, right. So values. yeah, this, this is in the, uh, with this, the connection here is the connection object we talked about earlier that's held by uh, a shared pointer. So this connect would close the socket and maybe set the member function to say, we really want to close. So whenever there's a handler being called, you better not do anything if closed yeah, is set to true. For, in, yeah. for instance, something like that, yeah. Um, so how can we, how can we like, abstract this out and have it only appear once in our code. Well, we can wrap our, hand, our completion handlers. So here's an example of a handler wrapper. So um, basically it takes a handler as a template argument. It just moves that into its own underlying handler member, member at the bottom, handler handler. Uh, and it overloads the call operator you know, with whatever, any arguments. And it forwards them to the handler. So, so far we haven't done anything but this is just uh, wrapping. Uh, and then we have the try catch blocks. Did you see what, what happened there? <laughs> okay, so there's one more thing. I'm adding an error handling interface. Let's assume, let's suppose that we have some, uh, say, uh, virtual base class polymorphic interface uh, that knows how to handle errors. We take that and we store that also. And if there's an error, we call functions on it.
So right, that's the new invented things that you just have to assume uh, works. Um, yeah. So so this is the the, the important, the interesting, uh, interesting part of this idea. Uh, now let's talk about allocators. And I promise th these will converge at the end, but we might be out in the weeds by then. So bear with me. Uh, so imagine that your connection object is sending or receiving bytes at, say, a gigabyte per second. Your on-read and your on-write handler might be called quite frequently. And uh, to actually heap allocate a handler object might uh, be costly. So, so this is what we did in, uh, in our uh, on-read, right? We called studbind, which constructs a new uh, function object, and we pass that in, and somehow the networking TS will copy that into its uh, job queue onto the heap, um, right? And if, even if you use Lambda, there's going to be some function object that needs to be copied. Um, so with allocators, we can do this more efficiently. So looking back at the connection object, we have the on read and async read some loop and the on write loop. Uh, let's put some handler storage right next to them uh, with allocators. So th now I'm going to try to illustrate what, what we're getting at, and then I'll show you the code. So basically, let's just uh, look at on read. It will call, so we're in the on read handler. It will call async read sum. It will invoke our, hand, our allocator and will say, yeah, here's some storage right there in our connection object. So put the handler there. Oops. Uh, and then, you know, kernel something something uh, is happening in the background. And then the, uh, it completes. And, and this is a really important part of the networking TS and, and Boost ASIO, which also needs to be replicated when you build your own uh, abstractions or higher level functions. The handler is deallocated before it's called. What does it mean? Well, it means it's moved onto the stack, deallocated, and then called. And this is really important because if it didn't do that, when we come back to our own read again, it really needs to be available so that we can re uh, kick ourselves off again and reuse that same space. So with this loop, uh, the handler is going to be stored uh, inside our, our object, and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, so to implement an allocator, you need three things, or at least this kind of allocator. Uh, we need the storage, the, the yellow thing, or it was yellow at one slide, uh, for the storage itself uh, of the handler. And we need the allocator class. Uh, which is is standard allocator, but they're simpler these days than they used to be. Uh, and then we have the handler wrapper. And we've already seen an example of a handler wrapper for the error um, for the error handling. And the handler wrapper is really only there to uh, as a way to communicate which allocator we want to use. Uh, so the handler storage is really just uh, an alias. We can use std align storage, and it takes the size. So we have to sort of uh, come up with some reasonable size uh, that we think will fit. And we need to align it to, well, max align T seems like a reasonable thing to align it to. Uh, supposedly, they, that, su that supports any type. Uh, so let's look at the allocator itself. A little bit more code, but this is still complete. This actually works, pretty sure. Uh, so what are, what are we doing here? Uh, this is the, probably the simplest allocator uh, because all it does is whenever you try to allocate something, it says, yeah, sure, here's a pointer. And it's always the same pointer. And whenever you try to deallocate it, it's like, I don't, I don't need to do anything. Uh, so maybe an allocator that always fails would be simpler. But this is the next simplest allocator. Um, so this is just mostly boiler, boilerplate to say what kind of object we're we're allocating, and uh, so let's move on. This is the pointer to our storage. So this is the handler storage size. Size is a template argument. Oh, by the way, the template arguments here. T is the type that we're allocating. Size is the size of our storage. We need a pointer to the storage because that's the pointer that we're going to return in the allocator function. Uh, and the constructor, we just need to take. We need to know what that pointer is. So that gets passed in. Uh, 
and we store it in M storage. And then we have the allocate and the deallocate function. Simple, just take our storage, reinterpret cast it to whatever type we're trying to allocate and return to the pointer. Deallocate, we don't do anything, we're done because we only have one uh, slot anyway. Um, this is actually an interesting uh, part of allocators. There's this rebind meta function. Uh, so a meta function is something that takes types as arguments and re returns types as return values, sort of return types. Uh, so what rebind does is it, it, it's a way to say, I have this allocator of, of this type, but I want an allocator of this other type. Can you rebind this allocator to be an allocator of this type instead? So, so what we do here is we just return ourself, but with u instead of t as the first template parameter. So that's how we rebind uh, rebind it. And then the, the last constructor there is a template constructor so that you can construct an allocator from the same kind of allocator of a different type because we don't care. It's just a pointer to some, some storage anyway. So we copy the, that pointer of storage, right? All right, that's, that's the allocator. Now the last part, the handler wrapper. And this should be familiar now. We have the handler and we need to know the, the, have the pointer to our storage. Uh, actually, yeah, right. This is the familiar part, forward to the underlying handler uh, and get allocator. This, this is the key. The whole reason we have this wrapper to begin with, uh, the networking TS will call this function to get our allocator and then it will use it if we, if we have this function. So that's where we pass in the storage uh, pointer. Uh, yeah, so we don't just need the get allocator. We also need the allocator type, type def, and you know that's the type, that's the allocator that we that we want to use. So, um, what if the handler that's being allocated is larger than our buffer? That's normally pretty pretty bad news. Like uh, what I've shown you so far, you would just get corruption and uh, you know a bad day, probably long a lot of debugging. Um, so one simple thing you can do is, if you remember this rebind call, in this rebind call, uh, we actually get a hint of what type is about to be allocated using our allocator. So we could just put a static assert there to make sure that that type u, its size has better be less than or equal to our size of, of, of the buffer. And, you know, just fail compilation. And then... Interesting that you brought up the error message. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, not, only, <laughs> not only is it hard to know which handler is failing, uh, it's hard to know what the actual, like, okay, your size constant, what should you set it to them to make it work? You can like try a few times and increment it a little bit. Uh, there's a trick. I'm not sure I have time to go through the trick. Um, uh, okay, let's go, let's go through the trick. It's simple. Uh, <laughs> So meta functions, these are two s trivial meta functions. They're identity functions. They take, they take a size t called v and they return that value. So they take a value, they return the same value. They both are identical. The only thing that differs is the name. So one is required size, one is available size. So you might have a clue of where I'm going with this. Uh, and then we have another very simple uh, meta function that takes two types and it has a static assert for the first that the first one colon colon value is less than or equal, equal to uh, the available colon colon value and fail if uh, if it isn't and then it just returns the available value anyway so it basically it only uses the required for the purposes of the static assert uh, this will tie the names of required size and the actual integer uh, and the available size and the integer into the type that's failing the static assert and you will actually get these uh, values in your error message uh, and for extra credit you can actually add another uh, template argument to identify which handler it is you know, you might have multiple handlers in your program so so that you know exactly which handler was failing you know, there's still going to be a lot of code around the useful message but you know at least you have a useful message somewhere in there so basically this is how you would use that in the rebind uh, instead of just putting a static assert directly, you sort of thread uh, 
these values through the the message the alert message uh, meta function so basically this whole yellow thing just evaluates to size it's just a, a long winded way of saying size uh, but with a good error message if it fails um, right so if you recall earlier the composed operation that we did it didn't it didn't have the get allocator function on it it was actually not really an ideal uh, way of implementing a composed operation because it may have had a very fancy uh, handler callback passed into it with with an allocator with its own allocator and then we're just like well we're not going to use that allocator we're just going to you know not use anything so ideally you should forward the allocators used by your underlying handlers uh, and there's also uh, actually executors that are associated with handlers that you should propagate. I've sort of been avoiding talking about executors. Um, uh, so instead of showing how to do that, uh, I'm going to point out that in beast, boost beast, there's an async base uh, that you can derive from that helps you do a lot of these things to sort of make it a little bit uh, simpler and saner. Uh, and also that boost beast actually has a lot of really useful utilities. It has a bunch of different kind of buffers, also like ring buffers and flat buffers and um, useful even if you're not using WebSocket or HTTP. Um, okay, now let's rush through this. Uh, this is the last topic, promise. Uh, so let's put this together. Let's have an allocator and the error handling in one. So you can you can wrap them, right? So you can have you can so your handler would, would essentially end up being the this error handling interface pointer, the storage pointer, right? The, and the error handler interface probably points back to your connection object because that's where you're going to have uh, you know the handler functions for for errors. Um, and then the handler itself is going to be your underlying handler, uh, which internally is going to be a shared pointer to yourself and a member function pointer to onread. So you end up with all these pointers uh, and really you only need one. You only need the shared pointer to the connection object. So you're sort of bloating your um, uh, your handler if, you, if you're just um, naively uh, putting them together, wrapping them. Uh, the, mem the member function is known at compile time. Which member function do we want to run? We don't actually need to store the function, the member function pointer in the handler. It's, it's known. The handler storage is known at compile time also, given the connection, uh, the connection object. And the error handler functions are also known at compile time. They don't even have to be uh, a polymorphic interface for them. So we could do something like our handler just contains a, a shared pointer to ourselves. And then in our call operator, we just call on read. And we just call on error, on exception, on self. Uh, and in, in the get allocator function, we just call self uh, our handler storage, because there's going to be a W uh, handler storage also. Um, but how do we do this? Well, you use templates, of course. Uh, so, so this is. Uh, this is a handler wrapper that takes uh, the type of the connection object, the member function pointer. So the member function pointer is a template argument. The error handler pointer, a uh, function pointer. Error handler member function pointer. The exception handler member function pointer. The type of the storage and the pointer to the storage, uh, which is a data member pointer. All of these our template arguments, no net compile time, no need to store them anywhere. We contain our shared pointer to T, to, to ourself, and then you know we just construct it from, uh, from the shared pointer and move that in to our member. Uh, we have the function call operator, uh, and we have the, the allocator type. We can get the allocator type out of the, well, actually, we know what the allocator type is. Um, we know what the size is because we can pull that out of the storage type, which is template argument, and that's a, a compile time value. And then we have a get allocator function. So the get allocator and the member function point, uh, the, the get allocator and the call operator 
function. So what do they look like? Well, they look like this. So if you're not familiar with how to use member function pointers and uh, data member function pointers, you basically use the arrow star uh, on a pointer. You can also use dot star if you have a reference. So, and this is familiar, right? This is the same as the error handling uh, handler wrapper, but instead of using uh, sort of runtime, figuring out runtime what to call, we just call make static calls directly to them. And again, these are template parameters. Super efficient. Uh, so this is how we will use it. So it's not super convenient to use. You get a lot of code. Uh, so this is the, the new way of, of invoking async read sum. You have the buffer and you have your read handler type, but the read handler type is kind of takes a while to to say. But I haven't I haven't solved that problem yet, but I think it's fine. Uh, so then you get small compact handlers and uh, you know just have to uh, you can pick everything out of your connection object that way. Finally, I, I think I ran over a little bit. Uh, so in summary, my, rec my recommendations are for lifetime management, use connection objects that's held by a shared pointer at the top level, so not the things that you're meant to compose, and for things in between that sort of do uh, in between complex things, uh, use composed operations and make sure that your handlers that you are responsible for calling are only called once or exactly called once I should say uh, and when you're composing operations propagate the allocator and the executor from the underlying handler to your handler so that you use the same allocator and the same executor as was intended to use uh, and I find it convenient to wrap handlers for uh, error handling. Um, I use both of these techniques that I've shown. Um, yeah, and allocators, avoid heap allocation. That might be the last thing to do when you need to crank out that last, that last bit of performance. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a good question. Right. Will will they not be inlineable after you take the address of them? Yeah. Um, I have no idea, but I would I would suggest that maybe it's not as dangerous as taking the address of them at runtime because you're at least doing it at compile time. Yeah. So there's no ever, not like there's no code ever at runtime that holds pointers to them. Mm -hmm. So. Who knows? Yes. You said that the whole thing is a moving target. The network. And would that make it difficult for me to build like a super complex application? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think so. Uh, maybe a little bit, uh, some aspects of it. Um, but the, the, the fundamentals, I think, are pretty likely to stay. Uh, to stay uh, as they are, uh, like the the I think the the most controversial aspect uh, of the networking TS is the executors, uh, because uh, like the IO context basically how how you post jobs and wh where they get executed and how they get executed, that's probably something that's going to change uh, together with the network uh, with the executors TS. They're being unified, uh, hopefully for C plus twenty three, but that that's sort of basically been the main reason why networking TS isn't in the standard yet. Uh, the other, the, one more thing that changed recently was how there's a concept called dynamic, dynamic buffers that helps you with things like I want to receive uh, bytes and I don't know exactly how many, so here's a, a thing that can grow. Uh, like that, the interface for that has changed in the last few months. Uh, so Boost Beast hasn't up, been updated yet to, to use the new. And uh, there is also the non-Boost uh, um, RCU version, so you can use it. Yeah, it right. B boost RCU is... Boost as you supports all the networking TS plus some, and it's also backwards compatible. Uh, so that's if you're worried about something chain breaking you, uh, Boost as you might be a safer bet. Harald. The whole interface seems to be super expert friendly. Yes. And 
Uh, well, I, I specifically use this for BitTorrent, which is a non-trivial networking application also. Like, um, I, it's really important to me that I can have an outstanding read operation and an outstanding write operation at the same time, for instance. And um, uh, this is not exactly what you're talking about, but, but you need to have, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of gets complicated. And I would say that it also gets easy, like, or there are easy aspects of it. Let's back up 147 <laughs> slides. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, this example is pretty simple, right? Isn't it? <laughs> just, just put the lambda directly, you know, then it, you can squint and it's sort of like something and dot then and here's the lambda to do it. So sort this of. example does sleep five. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, but I, I think the easy part would be like uh, Beast will be the, the higher level that would be easier to use. Right. And, and networking TS would be the. Uh, right. So, the yeah, the, the comment is that, is that if you're using HTTP or, or WebSockets, Beast is uh, definitely raising the, the abstraction level. Uh, but it's also, it's also expert friendly in the sense that you can always, or there are a lot of ways to like yeah. dig in and open the hood and like uh, yeah, do custom things. Right. Right. Yeah. K Q and EPOL are not very uh, like beginner friendly either, and this is basically sitting on top of that. Yes. Uh, there's been some recent criticism from Apple that uh, there's lacking uh, um, TLS support. There's no TLS. I know. Yeah. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've only read what I read on the Boost mailing list mostly, and the papers that have been published on this. Uh, I think that it's. I think that it would be strange to have the low-level primitive have SSL support. I think the the way Boost ASU does it, like it, Networking TS supports SSL. You can build it on top of it. That's how it supports it. That's how that's how Boost ASU does it. And I definitely agree that it would be super great to have SSL support in the standard. But I don't think it has to be like as the most like primitive thing. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, a comment to the non-expert users. Did you just conclude we should wrap it in Cython? Like you write the <laughs> all the complex functions here, and then do they give all experts a Python function? <laughs> <laughs> I, think was, I mean, it was like the perfect overlap. Like, what? Why should you do this? It's super complicated. Well, that's why. You should do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you.